Hello, everyone. I'm Sam Ekman of Gold Derby here with John Robin Bates from Feud, Capote versus the Swans, writer and executive producer. And you wrote all uh, eight episodes of this series, which is no small feat. So what was it about this story that really made you fall in love enough to take on that huge task? Well, I think I loved the moral questions at the heart of of it and and also the sort of anthropological ones uh the moral questions being when you're an a, a writer uh and you you you're using everything around you which is is an unstoppable uh mechanical event as a as a writer do you have an obligation to the people you have relationships with uh, and are using in some way to be responsible to them in some way. Um, Joan Didion famously said that that uh, a writer's always betraying someone. And um, I, I, I've, I think I've, I spent many years as a playwright drawing from the experiences I'd had growing up and as an expatriate American in Africa and South America and my father's work and my family's adjustment to uh, incredible amounts of unfamiliar and foreign stimuli. And I wrote about that quite a bit in my own. And um, I, I, you know, as you get older, you, you, you grapple with, you know, what you've done in your life and is it fair? Have you been decent? Well, at least I do. I do. So I, I got a chance, I thought, to explore that with Truman, who seemed to not realize that, that he had this thing called a soul, which might, or a conscience, which might come back to haunt him. Um, but he had so much pain that that uh, it was just more pain, probably, in the wake of what he did, writing about them. And then anthropologically, I'm sorry I'm giving really long answers, but you, you can shut me up if you like. Um, anthropologically, the societal stratification of New York society and the very rigid place those women occupied and operated within and, and how they set manners and fashion and behavior and how they lived as avatars in a way of something unattainable. <clears throat> that was interesting to me too, because I'm I I also write a lot about how systems, quote unquote, work in the world. Hmm. So this had everything really. Um, betrayal and sort of social hierarchy. You mentioned a bit about pain in there, uh, which I thought was interesting because this show is under, you know, the feud banner, and there certainly are these two warring factions but underneath that there's a lot of love especially when it comes to Truman and Babe and it's this interesting thing of mixing weaving together an extreme sense of love and pain how did you kind of approach those two sides of the story love causes pain um when it's ambivalent in some ways I think, uh, and what love isn't, to some extent, conditional. Um, it's something I think we all feel is, uh, what are we not getting? What are what are the what are the areas of of sadness within love? And maybe that's just the way my heart works. 
but I find love to be both joyous and also a reminder of our mortality at the same time. This won't last forever. We die, we lose the people we love, we age. Um, are, are we capable of disappointing those whom we love uh, to such an extent that, that love is compromised? I, I've always found love to be beautiful and yet have a little aura of sorrow around the edges of it. Mm. Uh, it makes it more romantic. Those women, though, are very poignant to, to me in, in how they stuck together. You know, they're not, to my way of thinking, uh, simply shallow. They, they're very human. Um, pain isn't only reserved, I think, um, for for those who are uh, say impoverished or it, it transcends class, doesn't it? Yeah, uh, and I find that interesting. Mm. You know, I have noticed in life that very rich people tend to end up congregating together. And it at times it seems like the only thing they have in common is extraordinary wealth um, without naming names. There's a very, very, very famous or very rich gentleman uh, who's gay and quite, quite uh, progressive politically. And yet he's very close friends with one of the richest people in the world who is lives in the sort of far right. Mm -hmm. But they meet in this kind of pragmatism and in both their lives, the pragmatism of billionaires. And sometimes I think uh, it ends up uh, creating a kind of a, um, segregation. And I think those women are sort of living within in that segregated, gated community. Uh, we have incredible freedom to do not things not in the public eye as just normal sort of civilians in the world. We, you can walk undisturbed in the world. Uh, but, you know, take Lee, for instance, Lee Radziwill, who I find the most extraordinarily pained of them all um, and beautifully rendered by Callista. Uh, wherever she went, the cameras followed. Where, and I used to see her in Eastern Long Island when she was still with her bras. And um, even out there, and this is in the 90s before, you know, privacy was gone forever, um, there were cameras. Wow. We don't have to live with that. That would make me sad. Yeah, it's an incredible group of women that play those swans um, and they get to deliver. You've write, written them a lot of uh, zingers and, and like these great takedowns that come out of that pain. What's the kind of secret to being able to write that type of line? I think you have to put on their clothes, so to speak, psychologically. But I'm very... Um, influenced by by what I see them wearing in photographs, the poses. I think I might have a, a touch of a, of empathy sickness um, 
and I, I'm not, I'm sure it's completely inac inaccurate, whatever I'm feeling, but I project onto them, um, a mood. I guess it's painting to me in a way. Like a painter can't just render uh, the visual likeness, I think. Uh, it, there has to be some connection to what they are. Um, and it's often not very pretty, but the zingers, I, I, I feel like they're armor in a way. Uh, they're used to deflect. They're used to um cover the pain they're they're a form of jewelry and ornamentation um so it's projection really i and i would like to be able to in real life um have that kind of tongue but i can only do it pretty much in creating characters so i get to be cutting in a way that I don't know that I am free to in real life. <laughs> it, it was a different, uh, you know, thinking about writing for Truman Capote. He's obviously, a you know, is a writer, an author himself with a very distinct voice. What was kind of the challenge of trying to find how that man speaks? Well, once you do hear his voice, it becomes almost automatic where you 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 sort of hear that kind of wonderful um floating dissonant otherness that he has and you you know i can't i'm not an actor really uh but I hear again, and I, I think you hear him, you hear his mannerisms, and you try and stop thinking. Uh, it's similar to acting. The voice it just stays in your head while you're approaching it. And it's a very particular cadence and particular uh, way of playing with language and I think you it doesn't hurt to try and, and to have a sense memory of inebriation and uh, dislocation in it, and also the ability um, to do kind of verbal sword play at the same time. Um, but that voice is is all over, and there's so many, so many interviews with the man that you once you start listening, you know. And isn't that the life of of writing that you you kind of live with voices in your head, uh, and and that's all you've got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There there's a few moments that I really appreciate where, you know, even though we're telling a true story, you kind of are able to take a little bit dramatic license, like the imagined meeting between him and James Baldwin for that episode. What, where does that come in? You know, how do you get to a point where you say, okay, I need to take a little bit of license to highlight something. How does that choice come about? Well, um, to me, it's like playwriting. You, you know, you. I knew, and Ryan knew we needed an outsider to come in, and and look at it and give Truman an opportunity to explain it in a way that he could never do, to say um, Jack. Uh, or the swans, of course. Uh, a, a shrink is boring, uh, ultimately. But James Baldwin is a moral voice and is uh, 
living in a kind of courage and profundity. And so he's very attractive to me. Um, and they had crossed paths many, many times. And uh, I had read some diary entry of Truman's where he was very dismissive of of uh, of Baldwin. Uh, and so I thought, you know, you could create a kind of antagonism. I love Baldwin very, very much. Uh, I, uh, in some ways, he was the bravest of the brave. The way Truman, ironically, was also brave in his own way in, in that he sort of was unapologetically himself. But there's something about the way Baldwin was a kind of warrior and an intellectual, a public intellectual um, in the same time as Truman, but without the cruelty. Uh, and then I thought about the dynamism of, of two gay men who, in a way, can't really be friends. Um, for various reasons, and that felt like a play to me. And I'm, you know, sometimes I, I kind of miss playwriting a bit in this stage of my life. I'm, I'm, obviously, I'm, you know, I work with Ryan a lot, and we're making a lot of television together. And there are days when I'm, uh, 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 uh what's the word? I'm slightly jealous of the people who have stayed in the theater, but I got to write a, pl a, a filmed play in a way. Uh, and it's very odd television. I mean, who gets to do that? I was, had the protective umbrella of Ryan over me. Uh, and the um, enthusiasm and ability to 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 leave us alone that the studio was was granting us um but i don't think that exists as sort of real world television and i love that episode for that and um chris chalk who plays baldwin is mesmerizing i the two of them in the world, I thought, was a break, in a way, from the feminine gaze. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But and two think... outsiders together, one trying to help the other. And, and to me, Baldwin was everything Truman couldn't be. Is that's, hmm. that's, um, and that's sort of a, a great that's sort of a great dynamic again to to be able to play with yeah and i think one of my favorite uh moments of kind of license that you took uh besides that episode is the final moments of babe and truman's life when they appear to one another because it goes back to that dynamic of love we talked about before what what made you arrive at that choice to kind of have them end in this, you know, vision with each other. Truman's last words were beautiful, babe. Um, and then I think that unlocked that unlocked what was going on in, in his corroded, rusty, um, consciousness, tragically, what, what you see in the hallucinatory last moments of regret 
and missing and sorrow. Look, it's unbearably sad to me um, that they couldn't reconcile. And you obviously, you know, you can sense Babe's yearning for that reconciliation, but because we all know that that it's hard to stay angry with people you love forever um, and in a way uh, someone once said to me someone I had a rough romantic moment with and uh, when we sat down together to talk it over sometime later he said, um, my friends would kill me if they knew I was meeting with you. And that, in a way, stuck in my mind so much, so much while I was writing Babe. It, in a way, and this is the first time I'm realizing that, it became a kind of um, a thing written on a charm around my neck, almost. Uh, I didn't use that literal line, but I had to put them together in in considering how they'd been kept apart. You know it isn't real, and so therefore it 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 almost becomes well no not almost in my view it becomes even more poignant and painful that they they couldn't do that mm -hmm. um feuds to me this is sort of a difference between feud season one and feud season two um they they do in this case seem like a terrible waste uh and the causation the cause of 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 a lot of psychological damage um a lot of real wound um and i tried to live in that kind of space um that ultimately it's not it's not that they're glamorous, exciting people. It's that they hurt and hurt and hurt. Well, I think it was a wonderful job capturing that. So thank you so much, Robbie, for thank sitting you. down with me and a uh, wonderful job with Feud. Thank you. I'm sorry if I was too verbose. <laughs> Not at all. Thank you. Thank you.